thank you so much for being here. It's uh, November 22nd, and today is our stand-up meeting for FPGA and remote labs work at Open Research Institute. And what we do here is uh, we, we hear about what we've done over the past week and what we have planned uh, for the next week. If we need any resources to accomplish this work, uh, and if we have any roadblocks, and there's uh, plenty going on. So I will, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to James first um, to give him an opportunity to talk about Remote Lab South. Um, and before he, before he takes it over, um, we're in the, uh, I've talked with, with Keith. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I've talked with you yet, but we're, we're gonna uh, initiate an attempt to move equipment uh, pretty soon. So I'm, I don't know exactly when, but uh, since things are good at Remote Lab South, we'll be able to ship some equipment to you. All right, so anyway, the floor is yours, James. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Actually, that's pretty much the primary thing to report this week is that we're getting ready for the new shipment to come over and we're oh, uh, excited sorry. to get- No, it's, it's quite <laughs> I all right. I should have let mean, you hey, said it. <laughs> well, it, it that's, that's fantastic because it just means that everybody's on the same page that we're getting ready for the big shipment of new equipment. We're getting ready to get that all set up. And uh, Remote Lab South will be expanding its capabilities very soon, is the hope. Okay, yeah, I'll do all that I can to do it. So yeah, sorry for, sorry for that. You should have, you should have been the one to to present it. No, that is entirely fine because it, <laughs> it because it better shows that we're both on the same page. Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, yeah, so so those that um, that are listening, um, so Remote Lab South is uh, a a wider footprint in terms of science and tech than uh, than Remote Labs. West, which is uh, focused on digital communications. Uh, so there'll be lots more uh, posted and printed and, and photographed and videoed about it uh, over the next couple of months if all goes well. So thank you so much, James. We really appreciate you and everybody there. All right, I know Everest has some, some reports and progress. So I will, I think the floor should be his. Okay, hello everyone. Um, yeah, uh, some progress about uh, BB frame receiving, uh, uh, so with the mini tuner, uh, in order to uh, receive uh, after that uh, DVD GC. So, right now, the defragmentation of the BB frame is okay, and so I can. Uh, send uh, some uh, UDP packet with DB frame inside, and then we can uh, analyze it on the Wireshark. So it's a good start. Then, um, then I need to uh, implement DVBGAC, and there is several solutions to do that. Uh, the first is to uh, adapt the run uh, code, the GR DVB, uh, DVB GAC. Uh, the second option is to use a lib GSE from, uh, uh, from GitHub. And the other is uh, use the Rust version of uh, Daniel E4. GPZ, but it's only include the decoder. Uh, so here is where I am uh, on the FPGA side. Uh, so I get back from, uh, well, uh, uh, prior, I uh, changed the bus width from uh, 60 bits, 64 bits to uh, 32. But um, the, 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 the mod code is uh, well written by the encoder, but uh, the data are not OK. I don't know exactly why. So I get back to uh, 64 bits and then have the, uh, the same uh, issue with some mod code as before. So I wait for your uh, uh, COPS uh, details if it could uh, help on that. Back to you. Thank you so much. It's super interesting. All right, I'll turn it over to Paul. Uh, he might be able to answer your question and has a report on the 
on the COBS decoder work. Hello. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff's been going on on the COBS decoder. Um, let me show you a screen, if I may. Um, see if that's going to work. I did set this up in advance. Should work. <laughs> I'm not seeing the, the window in my choices. Well, I wonder why not. I can use this, I think. There it is. Yeah. That failed, didn't it? What are you seeing now? <laughs> random random uh, windows. Not it's not quite there yet. Okay. But you're let's... able to you're able to share, so it's uh, it's all you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think this program doesn't really know how to be a Macintosh program is the problem. Um, let me worry about that later. Um, what we've been doing is trying to create the uh, the decoder that receives COBS encoded data in 8 bits wide AXI interface, AXI stream interface. And we have made quite a bit of progress, thanks to help from Michelle. And uh, I've been generating timing diagrams that show the exact logic needed to decode COBS. And that turns out to be more complicated than I thought it was, uh, but not too terribly complicated. And I think I'm pretty close to having a set that, that'll work. I definitely have a set that satisfies the first six timing diagrams worth of, uh, uh, worth of test cases, which is what I wanted to show you. And maybe yeah, a little bit later in the, meeting i'll be able to do that um i'm not sure what the answer is to your question everest because uh i didn't really understand the question uh, but the idea is that cobs will help uh, with dividing up the incoming byte stream into uh, bb frames of whatever size they need to be uh, so if you're going to mix different bb frame sizes you're definitely going to want something like that uh, or else you'll have to rely on the uh, individual dma transfers being the boundaries and i think that's nearly too fragile to use this is why i proposed introducing cobs last week um, i don't want to go over all that ground again so if there's something uh, something more specific i can answer please ask that's uh, that's currently the status. Yeah, okay. So it's it should solve the problem of alignment uh, mainly for the DMA, uh, which means that uh, right now uh, the, the, the alignment and the telast is used. Um, and if the uh, transfer uh, transfer size of the BB frame is not aligned to that, then uh, well we we lose some uh, bytes, and with your uh, COPS solution, um, there should not well uh, we we don't have any issue with that because we we can. Uh, well, you know exactly when the BB frame uh, starts, right? That's correct, yes. And okay, when it so, is. <laughs> uh, and the, on the, uh, I wonder, well, on the encoding side, uh, I think the process is not very complicated. Uh, well, on, on the, to run on the, on the PS, uh, which means that uh, there is not a lot of computation, I think. Uh, well, it's more computation than uh, just a memory copy, but I hope that it doesn't, uh, well, for a little uh, ARM CPU, it doesn't uh, be too much of, uh, of uh, user CPU usage. I don't, 
I don't think it should be. It's, it's a very lightweight protocol and it's designed to be easy to implement for software that has access to the whole buffer all at once. The only reason it's complicated for me is that we're trying to pipeline stream it and it's not designed for that. It's designed to be buffer at a time. Um, and that only adds uh, you know a couple cycles of delay and some state machines to mess with. So it's not um, it's not much of a load. I don't think uh, you, my intention was that it would be used for loading mainly from files um, where you have all the time in the world to build them. But if you have to build them on the fly, that should be very feasible too. Um, I don't intend that this will be necessarily used for on chip. Um, you know, stuff that comes from the receiver is probably already going to be nicely partitioned into, into blocks and won't need cobs in order to stay partitioned correctly. Um, but anything that's a byte stream independent of uh, Axie style processing could benefit from cobs for the framing. Okay, so this uh, block uh, would be in front of the encoder of the um, of the current implementation encoder, or do you have to uh, modify the encoder, uh, particularly the metadata uh, input? It, it would go in front, sorry about the phone ringing in the background. It would go in front of the inline configuration adapter and there would probably need to be another, some, uh, some width adaptation because this block we're designing is single byte in, single byte out. Um, so uh, an additional width adapter might be necessary or a modification to the inline config adapter. I, I don't know exactly how it's going to fit in, but for now we're working in byte, one byte in, one byte out. Yes, I think that would mean it was it would be after. Yeah, it would be it would require something like that. Um, but yeah, it'll be separate. We're not going to put it as part of the encoder. We'd like the encoder to stand alone and be able to handle uh, pretty much anything and be reusable. So there there may be a little bit of of overhead in terms of um, programmable logic or fabric usage, but hopefully not too much. We've been trying very hard to make it uh, efficient. So Paul, do you want to try to work on getting some some of your um, audiovisual examples? Um, and then if, if Everest has anything else that he'd like to talk about, then we can let him have the floor. And then, uh, then Sasha can talk about some of the RF activities. Okay. Actually, I'm ready to try right now. Let me let me go ahead and see if that's going to work. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, are you seeing timing diagrams now? Yeah. Yeah, we sure are. Thank you. Okay. This is, I don't want to go through this. This is way too complicated uh, to go through in this meeting, but there is a document that walks through it in excruciating detail. And I would encourage anybody who has any interest in this to go read it and find my mistakes because I'm sure there are still mistakes in this document and in these timing diagrams and very possibly in the logic equations that we're going to use to implement them. Um, I'm using this new tool, new to me anyway, a new tool called WaveDrum. Uh, you can see some of the language up at the top. Uh, there's a whole, uh, whole mess of this little cryptic code. That's how you create the timing diagram. And then the diagram draws itself in this little online it can be an online tool or it can be a standalone tool like i'm running here or you, there are various plugins you can use that integrate it with other uh, tools but you can see we've got quite a few um, signals here involved in getting the logic right uh, and two delays although it's more complicated than that with all the handshaking going on uh, between the input data and the output data Unfortunately, there's no way to implement this as a standard axi stream that has no delay, uh, which you sometimes see in simple axi stream blocks. Uh, but this has the minimum amount of delay that will allow a, a nice synchronous implementation. I think we could do it with one cycle less, but there's no, no reason to push it that hard. And that would lead to messier uh, low-level timing. So this is what I've been beating my head against for the last week. And I'm now approaching some sort of conclusion on. Uh, please read the, the document. 
if you can and um, and let me know what I've done wrong. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a real big step forward to be able to have timing diagrams described with a bit of code because all of us that have used um, Visio and <laughs> Mac Paint. Mac Paint. <laughs> I made timing diagrams in Mac Paint back on the day. So yeah, it's just so nice to have a dis a description. It's very similar to me uh, to Open SCAD uh, for three D modeling, where you describe the shape and it renders it, and you can change it um, and then share it. It's really nice, and it's the lovely colors and and good fonts and all that. So. We're really super happy to find it and to incorporate this into our documentation. It's called Waved ROM, and I think there's a. Well, I'll make sure that there's a link to it in this uh, in this recording. So. Okay. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. I'm I'm mainly in charge of the test bench, and I'm learning how to make not stupid test benches. Um, so lot big learning curve for me to get back into the swing of this, and I've found several really neat open source um, methods. So, so far, what I've done is I've used the standard IEEE library to open files in a test bench and then read in the data for the COBS decoder. Uh, you know, so this is essentially the input data and some of the control signals and then produce a simulation in Vivado. And Sawato has a whole, he uses a, a, a much more um, sophisticated test bench suite uh, with his FPGA cores. And I didn't think that we needed all of that for this particular project. So so we're doing sort of the minimal, just open a file and then visually verify. Um, but the next step up will be uh, attempting to use either SWATO's methods or uh, use CocoTB, which is a, a neat framework in Python that does helps you do test benches. So we're on the test side of it because we we develop the test uh, test benches along with the, the code that we do. Um, you know, very important in order to make it reusable. Um, you know, so we're we're prioritizing that. And so this this will this is moving forward and will be published at the same time so that we don't have a situation where we're going to dump a VHDL code block on on someone without a way to to independently verify it, at least, you know, <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a basic level, you get all of the stuff that you need in order to verify it. So that's that's what we're out to do. All right. All right. Uh, Sasha. Uh, Sasha. Hey, does my microphone work? Yeah, you sound good. Cool. So I've been looking at the up converter and the whole everything like from IQ samples to an X band. And I had low, I, I decided to give like direct conversion. So like modulating directly at X band a look, but there aren't that many parts. And also there's the question of how good we can make the, how clean we can meet the emission mask and all of that. And I also talked to some friends and colleagues who have worked on similar projects and they all went with super hat and i think i'm going to go with super hat as well just to minimize technical risk and the additional cost is actually not that significant and the, another advantage of super hat is that it lets us be very it lets us have lots of choice in how we generate the initial analog signal because we can use the a the the ad let me look at the 9371 style parts if we can find them in stock but the analog devices has the ADRF 9000 series which is a bit more recent and those have the disadvantage of slightly less bandwidth and also not supporting JE, the JESD they're all like I think CMOS or LVDS but they have the advantage of being an act they have the advantage of actually being in stock, which is a nice thing with the chip shortage being what it is. But also super hat lets us use if if that won't end up so we can use we can have we can be pretty free in how we generate the signal. We can use and we can use like discrete uh, 
a pair of discrete DAGs, an analog device that has a bunch of these, and an analog IQ modulator to generate like IF, which is probably, I, I looked at the numbers of it, and I think around like one to two gigahertz is a good place to put the IF to avoid having lots of spurs. And yeah, I, I also, I, I also started looking at parts for the actual like X band up converter and also parts for the what's it called the X the X band the 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 L O for the up converter, which is not necessarily X band, but it is pretty high. So it it will need a, a it will need a pretty capable synthesizer. And that synthesizer itself will need a pretty good very low phase noise oscillator because phase noise there is going to because of how the because of the the pll is going to amplify the phase noise we want the phase noise to be as low as possible on the oscillator so i've been looking at parts for that and also i think i converged on on an initial set of parts and i'm going to try and get my company to expand step board for these and now what i'm looking at is figuring out how the the easiest way to to just test it and the things that I would uh, I'm I'm thinking of for testing is it's the, the both I want to to both look at the spectrum quality so that's going to need to be a spectrum analyzer of some of some flavor and also I want to I want to get a look to see how how the modulation itself gets distorted by the up conversion and I'm I I had a question. I know that there's the deck tech series of PCIe DPBS2 receiver cards, and those are kind of expensive. I'm wondering, do y'all know of, of some like a bit less expensive DPBS2 receiver? It's, it's fine if they're like software defined or, or PCIe cards. The form factor doesn't matter much, but I'm wondering, are there ones that are like slightly less expensive? That will give that will give like EVM output and like signal to noise ratio. Yeah, it's a good yeah, question. A good question. Uh, uh, Paul may know, Paul the, may answer know the answer immediately. But I would say I would that, say you, that it, any sort of um, SDR, like a like USRP, a, like a USRP or, something or something like that, something like that with GNU Radio, with GNU might, radio might, might do this. Might do this. Okay. Now we have and good we have cards good in remote labs, remote labs, so if it's going so to be an open source, open source project, project then, then you can use them. You can use them. Oh, what, what, what cards are those? Let's see, I think the exact model number is on the remote labs repo. Let me go get that. OK, yeah, I'll, I'll finish giving the end of my status update while you search for that. And yeah, I. I the I don't yeah like I'm I'm totally fine making my work open source. It's just that like getting getting like I'm probably going to be playing around with dev boards and stuff, and I'm it's just the physical logistics might be a bit complicated of getting like the signal to the card <laughs> from dev boards that I have physically here in Seattle. So that that would that would be my only like difficulty slash concern. So yeah, I've been looking at yeah, just also the other thing that um that I had a a question for y'all was, do y'all know of like good down converters from like X band, whether it's like ten gigahertz or eight gigahertz, to like a lower thing that a that a like SDR receiver card can ingest? Yeah, yeah. We, we, everybody uses a a standard, uh, a standard LNB, LNB, like from like Directv. From DirecTV. Okay, and then that hooks up directly, to, directly an to an RTL SDR. An RTL it's, incredibly SDR. it's incredibly cheap, so you can go from oh, ten gigahertz, gigahertz all the way down, all the way down, to, down to whatever, whatever, um, cool. pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. It, it's, it's the performance, it's, performance is, is, you know, it's, you know, it's an RTL, RTL SDR, but but, but that is what but everybody that's uses, what everybody uses for oh. receive oh. first off. First off, can you also link me like the information about the direct the the down converter itself, the LNB? Yes, thank you. So yeah, if you can if you can get me the information on the receiver card and the LNB, I'd be super grateful because that gets me closer to like having something I can test those the up converter dev boards with. So yeah. Yeah, Paul, double, yeah, Paul, double check me. Check I put, me. In, I put chat in chat the things that, the we, things have. that we, we have. We have a TBS, TBS cards, cards, a set of TBS, set of TBS cards. cards. 
That looks right. That looks I'm right. looking yeah, at the same, at the page, same probably. page, probably. The, uh, the remote, remote labs, labs. Um, uh, test, equipment test equipment directory, directory has, has documentation has for all the items, items we have, including, including both, of those, both of those tuner cards. Tuner cards. Oh, interesting. And do those do, do those tuner cards like give give, give like signal to noise ratio and EVM and all of that? I think they do with the software. software. Say, say again. I think that the think tuner cards the tuner do, cards depending, do on depending on the software, on the software that you use to drive them. Drive them. Okay, I'll I'll take a look at that, and I'm I think I'm just going to order myself uh, one or two of those. Thanks for get, giving me the part numbers and all of that, just so I have a known quantity to work with. Yeah, those yeah those those are older, those are cards, older cards, and there may and be there a may be updated, updated, updated version, version of them. Of them. But that's the that's sort the of sort of. Like a, like a ballpark and the, and the, the manufacturer, manufacturer and the, the, particular, the particular model, model line. line yeah i'm not sure how, not cheap, sure how they cheap they are those are kind of expensive, those are kind of expensive cards, cards, I cards i believe i i googled it and i see a shop selling them for like 160 euros which is expensive but not as expensive as one of my friends pointed me to a deck tech card which was like 2k dollars and that like that is yeah. that is expensive yeah, the deck tech cards, cards were, were much more expensive, much more expensive but those are the ones, those that, ones we that we were, were only, able, only to able to afford with the grant. Yeah. The grant. And the, the cards, the cards, tuner the cards, cards, those we were able to just buy, to on, just our buy on our own. Yeah. So I think there's so an order, order of magnitude between the two between sets. The two sets. Yeah. There's also the now, mini tuner. Oh, uh, yeah, the mini yeah, tuner, which may not be available. I think you might have trouble finding one. But it's a nice, it's little, a nice box. little box. They're, they're, much, they're less much less expensive. expensive. And they do and have, they do have upwards, upwards, lots of lots uh, instrumentation very nicely, very nicely displayed. displayed. I'm going to take a look at that as well. Thanks for pointing me towards that. Sure thing. Sure yeah, thing. Anything, yeah that anything, anything, anything that we have in remote labs, labs is, is available, for, available you for you to use. And, and we'll, we'll help you help get, you get uh, information, uh, information on whatever you need locally. Yeah, the, like, even if I don't end up using the physical ones over there because of just, I'm going to be playing with hardware myself where I physically am. Knowing, knowing the part numbers, knowing the, the, the software, knowing that like people have actually used this and it works, that in itself is extremely useful. So thanks. Yeah, very happy to help. All right. Any other comments or questions or anybody need anything? Um, have any particular roadblocks? All right. We're looking um, and we're working very hard on getting uh, a, a working revision, a working version of the, the little Cobbs decoder into the reference design. and and. I should also um, note that the pro, uh, processor side code for, uh, from Everest actually does work with the encoder. And um, when last we left that, uh, I think this was last week, I was totally thrilled. So Everest's processor side code, that, that minimal DVB test works. And the stuff that we uh, tried to, to use, uh, the, the code that we built up uh, from the from some of the example code from from analog devices we're not really sure why it times out uh, it times out every time so this has been a, a remarkably interesting thing that has happened to us uh, and we haven't gone back to that yet because we've been working on cobs but we will very quickly uh, in the near future come back to processor side stuff um, and I'm sure that the the secret is some minor difference between the way that Everest walks through uh, setting up and configuring all of the IIO uh, uh, devices and channels and things like that, uh, and the way that we do it. So there's, uh, there's very little differences, but it's got to be in there somewhere. And it's very exciting to see uh, a real honest to goodness transmission over the air for the encoder. And as soon as we get that, then we can start uh, working hard on the um, the, the w sort of the multiplexing and and bringing in the the receiver side. So what comes in on the receiver multiplexed and and figured out uh, and then transmitted uh, down correctly on the DVB S2 and S2X frames. Uh, so all of this will come together 
uh, we are, we're looking forward to having some some folks come back uh, that are that are on leave. Um, so and also the holidays are coming up. So if you are traveling or away, uh, we we look forward to to you coming back, and we'll all be working hard here to make things move forward. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time and effort and energy. It's totally worth it. I do have a brief update. I'll tell you about um, got contacted by a school. So this is from uh, Mastodon. So the there's a big free and open source software community on Mastodon and an amateur radio and radio, digital radio, a bunch of different communities on Mastodon. And we got uh, contacted by a school, sounds like a university research satellite. It's going to be operated on LEO and MEO, so medium Earth orbit. And they are doing a DVB-S2 adaptive coding and modulation downlink system. So this is not going to be available for amateurs to use as a communication resource. However, it's going to be used for uh, university research. And uh, if we can help them out in any way with the DVBS2 IP cores, then we will. So I've given them all the information to get in touch with us. Uh, I look forward to hearing from from them, and uh, it's very exciting to to see that happen. So if there's anything that they have that we can use that's uh, open source, then we will incorporate it and to make our our projects better and and vice versa. So it's uh it's nice to nice to see that. So. If I, over the next week, if you see anybody new in FPGA, I'll, I'll make sure to, to introduce them and, uh, and identify what they're, what they're about. All right, thanks everybody. I think we'll close um, out. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Everest left, left an interesting link to a, another uh, DATV receiver in the chat there. Oh, it looks like a, maybe a clone of the mini tuner. Uh, do you have any comments on that for us, Everest? Oh, just just because uh, there is some stock on mini tuna, and this is uh, uh, an adaptation from Elad. I think it's an Italian uh, uh, manufacturer, but it is a mini tuna inside. Um, it is just because it is available and uh, it's in it's in a box. And uh, that's it. But uh, there is other option to uh, to order a mini tuner. The the main issue right now is that the NIM. So the the the, the doorbell rang and somebody knocked on it. I I could not get away. I'm running a meeting. Just a, like a minute or so ago. I couldn't get away. I'm running a meeting. Michelle, you're not muted. Oh dear. <laughs> Sorry. The doorbell <laughs> rang. I've, thank you. I tried to mute. I really apologize, Everest. No problem. Apparently, um, there's there's a delivery that came, so I'll fix it in post. All right, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the, the main issue with the mini the, with the mini tuner, where well, it's the NIM, and this is um, where well, the the receiver uh, and the demodulator, the ST demodulator which is uh, not available well. I think that there is around 200 uh, pieces at the BATC, uh, so the British uh, TV. Um, and the interesting thing is that, uh, well, we can, we can still uh, find some uh, mini tuner PCB, but uh, we can maybe drive uh, uh the the this name uh using uh raspberry pico and it could be very easy to uh, to implement and have a, a direct uh ethernet um output well that's another story but uh, it's in, in the project i just uh, speak with brian uh, uh an english uh, guy to uh, which is working on the on this project that's it on the mini tuner. Sorry, uh, just just another question about the because it's very good that uh, you uh, you have work uh, well that my code is working on the ZC seven hundred six. Um, have you uh, tried to uh, reduce the the, the, the 
the sample well the sample rate uh, of uh, the AD board. That's the first thing, and the other is if you really want to um, uh, receive it on a DVBS2 receiver, you need to add the um, RRC uh, filter because else it's uh, it doesn't work at all. So you need yes. to uh, to add the filter. Uh, I just use a fear instead of the polyphase filter, which is very consuming, uh, uh, which consume a lot of uh, cells. Uh, so it's a fear filter, but uh, you have uh, the example already. I think. I don't know if you have implemented on the on the design. Yes, sort of. So we we've been able to um, experiment, I guess, uh, with the with modifying what they call the profile. And yeah. this has all of the clocks and it has a lot of information in it. So the profile for the ADRV 9371 is a, um, it's human readable, but it's a file that has all these configurations and it has, very importantly, it has the symbol rate in it. And we've been so far operating with just the default that just comes with it out of Pet Linux, and everything is wide open like at the highest clock rates. And so, and, and with a default filter too. And so we've, we're now realizing, um, we knew it all along, but now we, we're, we're getting a little bit more confidence with uh, updating and incorporating the, the correct profile. So I don't think we're at the point where it will work receiving it off of the air because of the things that you just said, that you have to have the right rates and you have to have the right filters um, and so very soon we will have to tighten that up and make it uh, make it correct uh, but we have been able to make things change over the air to go from you know <laughs> more than 100 megahertz wide signal to down to 50 uh, megahertz it's it's not as simple as um so in your code, when you send off the command to the Pluto and you're able to change these things directly with the uh, device rights, um, at least on the on the 9371, some of it's tunable and some of it's not. So the, and, and the transmit sample rate is one of the things that you have to actually set in the profile and you can't, apparently you can't write to the, the um, write that value and, and change it dynamically. At least we haven't been able to. Um, and then I'm not. I understand that we need to change the filters, and I, and I and we do have the the filter uh, utility. So it's a it's a program for our analog devices that we've been able to get running, and we've been able to to change the filters um, and and output the coefficients. And uh, we haven't closed the loop and put them back onto the device yet into the into the dev board. But we've got a good part of the recipe working, so that's that's going to be very important very quickly, I think, as we clear up these other challenges and get these things working. That we'll have to tighten up the filters and the sample rates and the clock rates, and and we're as Paul has pointed out before to me, like um, since we have a relatively narrow band, uh, the the 9371. The, you know, for 10 megahertz signals, this is actually the very lowest that this chip can do. It's the narrowest band, really. It's capable of very wide band communications, which is great, and, and people should use it for that. But for, for the amateur satellite subband that we're talking about, we don't have a whole lot of bandwidth that's pretty narrow. Um, and so in our case, we definitely are going to have to have a new profile and new filters and, and all of that. So anybody that knows how to do that better than us, uh, We'll we'll just keep plugging away and learning, um, but but everything that Evarista said is is correct, and and we need to worry about. Yeah, we will probably need an additional filter uh, to do the RRC before the band limiting filter that's built into the reference design. Is there an existing design for that that's already been used on the project? The Pluto has one. So there's a good example. I think that's what Everest meant when he was talking about an example. Were... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can, yeah it's, it's in the Pluto can, design. It's good. 
yeah, you can use the, the filter uh, uh, like this. And then uh, it just uh, uh, up sample by four and uh, make a RRC filter. So, um, so it reach uh, more, uh, well, higher bandwidth. So if you target 10 megahertz, then the sample rate on the profile should be 40 megahertz. Right. Yeah, with our with our roll off that we picked. Okay, I, yeah. that's I didn't realize that that wasn't already part of the encoder, but uh, good enough. No, know. no, it's not. It's not. It's not part of the encoder. No. The... No, no. It just it just after the encoder, you just plug the RSF filter. Um, maybe. Um, Gotcha. Okay. No problem. I'm ducking birds now. <laughs> Let's see not, what you did there. It is not dull here. <laughs> <laughs> There's doorbells ringing and packages and birds. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm just going to let the rest of the household fix that. Um, okay, any other comments or questions before we close out the business part of the stand up? All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you for. Uh, for hanging in there and doing such amazing work. It's uh, it's a huge honor to be able to be even a small part of this. So we will keep working and we'll be on Slack and we'll do this again next week. And, uh, and very much appreciate everybody. All right, and I'll be here for office hours and uh, open discussion after this, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll shut down and see you next week.